Asking me to pick my favorite Elder Scrolls game is like asking me to pick my favorite ex-girlfriend. Karen was really into numbers, was creative, a little rough around the edges, and complicated. She's the kind of girl you bring to meet the family, but what you really want to do is rub it in their faces while your cousins and siblings brood in their terrible relationships. Julie, on the other hand, was kind of ugly, but always down to fuck. You see, it's a really tough choice. Karen held out her fun side until we were in a comfortable rhythm with one another, and that's when the freaky side came out. We really started to explore our relationship, and Julie could do a full split. It's a really tough choice. I like to say that easy and limber Julie was my favorite and high five everyone in the comments, but I've always gone for the brainy chicks. However, every now and then, what you want is easy, uncomplicated, grudge fucking, and that's what Oblivion is. It's one grunting, sweaty grudge fuck with someone that you're moderately attracted to. You need that now and then. So how much has Oblivion changed from its previous title? Did they streamline too much, and is there any fun to be had within the mechanics of Oblivion? Well, let's dig in, shall we? Getting Oblivion running was not a straightforward process for me. The bitch wouldn't even start. So I had to go out onto the internet, a wretched, ungodly place full of temptation and sin, to find a solution. Oh, yes. With a focused mind, I typed in O for Oblivion, and though Google tried to sway me from my duties with O-related sex acts and descriptions, I pushed on and typed, Oblivion doesn't run on my fucking machine. Okay, hang on. About three million results. Yep, sounds right. So yeah, if you find yourself in the position where you can't get this shit to run, install OBSE, then install the unofficial patch. Once I did that, Oblivion ran like butter. If this doesn't work for you, hit up Google. She'll get you what you need. Just stay strong and focused and you'll get there eventually. As far as modding, I use the Nexus Mod Manager Community Edition for managing the mods because some of these mods in my list can't be installed manually reliably. I use OBSE, Oblivion Script Extender, and the OBGE, Oblivion Graphics Extender Core, and the unofficial patch. Once you have these installed, you can install some beautification packages like Blockhead and Oblivion Character Overhaul, but uh, prepare to have shit like this happen to you if you try to install Blockhead manually? Is this a fetish now? Mm. This better not awaken anything in me. I installed Oblivion Reloaded, but it did stuff like this from level 1 whenever you double tap a direction, which makes it happen seemingly on its own and I did not like it. It alters the state of play far too much in the early game, as it was a quick way to dodge a projectile and could make the game easier. Either way, we were looking at Oblivion and not its mods, so if you install this and find the dodge annoying, you can turn it off in the INI file like I did. You're welcome. For the purposes of this review, I have turned all the enhancements and mods off. So yeah, we're back to these derpy ass faces. The only plugin I used here is the unofficial patch and OBSE, which allows you to run the game without having to troubleshoot it every couple hours, or like in my case, uninstall it every time you gain a level. It was really fucking ridiculous. The first thing you'll probably notice is the mutant standing in front of you. That is what Bethesda calls a face. Notice that as I try to make the face look more human, the further away we get from God. You may be trying to change a single feature only to find out that when you change one slider, all the other sliders change with it. If I had to guess why this happens, I would imagine that the facial animation rig that Bethesda was using at the time was weighted funky and certain nodes bled into other nodes. Perhaps the facial mesh was so low poly that manipulating one polygon pulled on the edges of polygons comprising the eye sockets, cheekbones, and shit like that. It makes it nearly impossible to make your character look unique without making them look like waterheads. I'm gonna say something that you might not agree with, so hold on to your nuts. But I think Morrowind's default heads were better than these ones. At least they had a semblance of personality to them. With the Oblivion heads, it becomes hard to tell one character from another, because their base features are mostly the same, nose, lips, and so on. The only facial features that change is the thickness on the three axes of the head, and the color and texture 
of your human citrus. It's fun to see how ugly a head can get if you really buckle down and try your hardest. Some of these faces look straight up like Baker Fresh jaundiced pockmark pies. I can't stand watching the human equivalent of an Easter egg flap gums at me. It's disturbing. It's even more disturbing when everyone just looks like a bloated corpse dredged out of the swamp. What I'm saying is that we use certain features to identify the faces of people we know. Those parts just so happen to be the features that show the effects of age less. Lips, eyes, nose, unless you're already laying. I mean, Jesus, looks like if you go to war with Coke, Coke always wins. If the base head that every Red Guard, Imperial, and Breton use has the exact same nose, lips, eyes, and weird Marilyn Manson eyebrows, it becomes hard to identify who you're talking to. I don't normally critique graphics because I play games that are over 20 years old. But when the graphics are ugly or don't serve their purpose very well, then I have to say something about it. The thing is, you'll eventually get used to this. All the faces will start to resemble one another, and at some point you're going to stop trying to identify people, and the faces, they won't even raise a blip on your radar anymore. But every now and then, you'll see something so horrifying, so hideously deformed, that you must stop to admire the fact that someone saw that face and said, Yeah, the faces are fine, ship it. All right, let's move on to races. The next thing you might notice when looking at the character creation screen is that there are no numeric values given to you in relation to racial passives or powers. I hate character creators that hide shit. The impact of knowing what a choice will result in is somewhat lessened by the fact that you could change all this stuff at the sewer exit, but it is still a needless inconvenience that forces you to go through a four-step process to see the result of a choice. For an example of a good system, look at Fallout 1. Nearly every bit of info you need about your character is displayed all at once and updates itself in real time. It's like a virtual character sheet if you were sitting down to play D&D. So if they did something like this in a Bethesda game, we would be able to see the results of picking a Breton and what that will have on our fatigue and encumbrance, as well as health and magicka. And it wouldn't need to be guesswork or actual work writing it down on paper. If you are explaining a system that is pivotal to an experience like building a character, then you don't go for style over substance. You don't go with fancy menus and written narratives of the history of the races disguised as info about passives. Just give me the fucking numbers! If the info you're giving us is too vague, you're allowing the player to create a character they won't end up liking. Or will end up creating a character that won't survive, or they're not even able to have fun with. You've got to err on the side of explaining in detail without being too wordy. Aside from that, okay, enough, enough complaints about the UI for now, okay? Since the game isn't giving us the information, I went out to the wikis and I found that yes, the differences between races is just as complex as it was in Morrowind. Each race is different in ability scores. For instance, Breton males get 40 strength as opposed to Altmer. They also receive 10 less willpower and the sexes are still dimorphic. So that means that women have slightly weaker stats and strength than males of certain races with the most notable exception being Nords, whose women are just as strong as the men. If you want more details on this, check out the UESP wiki. It has handy charts for building a character. Skills have changed radically from Morrowind. Each race gets different bonuses to skills, with the most notable nerf being the Red Guards. Look how they mask with my boy. They no longer get a 15 bonus to Longblade, because Longblade, as a skill, well, it no longer exists. But instead, it, it treats long swords. get this, the same as daggers! This simple change kind of fucks them out of the greatest swordsmen and swordswomen title they had going for them, huh? So much for the sword singers and the song of the blade. I mean, okay, fine, Nords can be as good with blades as Red Guards are, but you literally based a lot of the culture of Red Guards around the blade, so... You know, moving on. Bosmer lose 10 points of personality and luck is increased to 50 for all races as well as an increase to Dark Elf females' personalities. Some notable changes are Nords getting not 100% immunity to Frost, but 50% immunity and losing all resistance to Lightning, and Altmer having their weaknesses to Fire halved and their magic weakness removed completely. There's also a ton of skill changes per race as well. All of that is far too complicated for your casual gamer to understand or even notice is happening, and Bethesda should have worked out a way to communicate this info to players. Maybe use the same method as in Morrowind, but expanded to include, you know, ability scores? I mean, 
I hope this isn't mind-blowing to anyone working at Bethesda and some other reason was reached for doing it this way, but you know, the way you guys have been doing these character creation screens lately has been getting more and more convoluted with each subsequent release, so come on, Bethesda, simplify your shit and give us more info on your characters! We don't need a fucking cart ride to the goddamn character creation screen! Enough is enough! Something that was added by Bethesda was racial reactions. Don't talk such a rot. There's a lot of racial bias in the Elder Scrolls. So you say. So for instance, Dunmer, Altmer, and Orcs don't like Khajiit. And if you think about it, it really isn't hard to hate a cat. I know that I don't like it when my cat makes a fancy feast of his balls on the couch while I'm trying to watch Seventh Heaven. What a dumb joke. It's like he doesn't even know that God is watching, so I get to hate, especially when I'm staring at an eye full of my cat's anus right now as I type this. Oh, I like that. In fact, there's no one race that other races think is just peachy keen, awesome, amazing, but there's plenty that races don't think highly of, including orcs and Dunmer, who are just kind of put up with by the general populace because they're both a little weird looking and whose own race could take or leave them. What nonsense. I mean it, like, orcs don't even like other orcs, and Dunmer don't like other Dunmer. Oh, where'd you get that? <laughs> you know, the weirdest looking races, Khajiit and Argonians, they elicit no emotional responses from the other races. Like nothing. Imagine how broken a person would have to be to be confronted by a talking man-cat, and not even crack a smile. That's just stupid. So in closing, the races of Oblivion are across the board very neutral. There's no resentment or outright hatred, which means that there's no conflict within society, which is another thing that Bethesda kind of, you know, streamlined with this game, which was the depth of conflict and creativity and world building. Is that so? That's super mean. Why do I say shit like this? You're full of it. Much has been quote unquote streamlined in Oblivion. There's still eight attributes, strength, intelligence, Willpower, agility, speed, endurance, personality, and luck. The higher your strength, the more stuff you can carry. The higher your strength, the more you can jump without getting tired. Oh yeah, and uh, before I forget to mention this, it also increases the amount of melee weapon damage you do, so, you know, there's that. It's pretty good, you should pick it up. Intelligence increases your magicka. Willpower increases the rate at which your magicka regenerates, as well as your total fatigue. It no longer determines how strong you are against magical debuffs. Basically everything that takes control away from you, like paralyze, calm, things like that. I mean, willpower literally means the power of one's will, so you'd think, you know, that they would resist the effects of these spells by the power of their own will. But you know, whatever. You do you, Bethesda. Agility will increase your max fatigue, your damage with bows, and determine how hard you can get hit before you get staggered. It no longer affects hit rate because Oblivion plays more like a shooter with swords that go ching ching as opposed to guns that go pew pew. And speed determines how f -f 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 fast you go. Endurance affects your fatigue, starting health and bonus health upon leveling up. It no longer combines with strength for starting health, and this can be a stat chosen by any weak character type, and they can still get a nice starting health without relying on starting strength to get that early game boost. This is a pretty decent change as it allows for a little more build diversity. Personality affects the disposition of characters that meet you, and unless you're going the illusion route, which can be absolutely fucking ridiculous, Hello friend, what can I do for you? Then this is a dump stat. Luck. It affects everything we do in a small way. Does it really though? I mean the reality is yes, it does. Except it doesn't influence athletics and acrobatics because those are hard set values that do not fluctuate. That means it affects about 10% of the things you do, as every Oblivion player knows that 90% of what you do in game is jumping. The higher your luck, the higher the chance of success will be on skills that require a check, and by small things that you do, like betting in the arena. So if there's a chance for a good outcome or a bad outcome with a skill or an event, this is influenced by luck, but not when searching containers for loot. Yeah, so that's it. Yeah, not much has been changed. I mean, just enough to be changed in order to make the combat a little more accessible. The word accessible acting as a stand-in here, a euphemism if you will, for mass market appeal. Now I'm no communist, okay? So I don't want anybody out there to think I got a problem with capitalism or anything. So don't go starting to like post ASCII versions of Karl Marx in the comments or ASCII versions of, you know, the sicker or, or the red star or any of that communism. Please do not do that. Please don't. 
drive stats is where things get a little interesting in the quote-unquote streamlining end of things, and it's where the player is taking the biggest hit. So for instance, encumbrance, which used to affect how fast you could run and how much stuff you can carry, no longer affects at all how fast you can run. So balancing your weight for a long trip to ensure that you get the most out of your fatigue is no longer really a problem. But listen. What it is, is it's still one more layer of depth that's been removed. And it frankly didn't need to be removed. The system would have worked. People would have understood it. Especially with how fast your starting run speed is. I mean, you definitely know when you were weighed down. You may find it slightly difficult to carry. Don't say I didn't warn you. Health is endurance times two, and it's rounded down, so having a 98 is a waste. Magicka is intelligence times two, plus whatever your birth sign and racial bonuses give you. This makes it so every point you put into intelligence increases your total Magicka, unlike endurance, which does nothing for two full plus five levels. It's kind of bullshit. Fatigue is no longer the most important stat in the game. At least that's what some people might tell you, but I'm here to tell you not to listen to that. If you're a melee fighter, fatigue is still your best friend. While it may not affect how often you hit or how often a spell fizzles, it does do something that is almost equally as important to melee characters. It affects how strong your melee attacks are by multiplying max fatigue by fatigue plus one, and the base damage is then multiplied by that outcome and divided again by two. I don't know what the fuck that means, but it sounds bad. Let's do some testing. What I found is that no matter what the weapon type, fatigue is what makes your attacks kill an opponent quicker. And in this game, where it feels like everything has a million hit points, you need the extra boost that fatigue gives you. So once again, watch that bar, because it is the guardian of your fun. I saw about a 30% increase in the amount of hits I needed to land before killing this skeleton. With every 50% of fatigue you lose, the ramifications on combat are pretty astounding. It turns it from this to something more like this. Skills have undergone a lot of changes, and to me, some of the changes are for the better, some are for the worst. Each skill undergoes five different mastery levels. Let's use hand-to-hand -hand as an example of what this looks like in action. At novice level, hand-to-hand -hand can do a basic power attack. An apprentice gains three times more damage with a standing power attack. A journeyman gains a left or right power attack that has a 5% chance to knock the weapon from their hands. It also allows the player to hit ghosts, as well as staggering an enemy on successful block. An expert gains a backwards power attack that has a 5% chance to knock someone down. A master gains a forward power attack which has a chance to paralyze. It's a 5% chance by the way. Max down hand to hand be looking like this. But for Wong Fei Hung it looks more like this. As you increase your melee skills and gain new mastery levels, you're also provided extra damage for each point invested. Magic skills decrease the cost of a spell based on how many points have been invested. All in all, these are good changes, because it feels like the skills are actually changing with the player. And just as a skill may be becoming boring, it morphs into something else to give the player new tools to deal with familiar situations. Let's look at acrobatics as an example. As a journeyman, you gain the ability to dodge, which, in theory, allows you to dodge attacks. This gives you yet another tool to deal with encounters, but it also influences how you play. If one of these features becomes a go-to ability for your player, then you've effectively changed the way they play the game. It also manages to stave off boredom for just a bit longer. It's a nice way to keep your players engaged and working towards goals. It also gives you a chance to roleplay a bit. Take Wong Fei Hung here, for example, my half-man, half-cat, drunken boxer. The dodge mechanic looks like something that a drunken boxer could perceivably do, so it's roleplaying friendly while also adding a new mechanic. Then there's changes that go over more like a lead balloon. My least favorite change is the ditching of the 10 skill system. Morrowind had roughly 27 skills, each broken up into reasonable categories or classes, if we're being honest. On its face, that might not seem all that important, but it is from a role-playing aspect. Not being able to pick non-combat related skills like enchantment takes a bit of story potential away from your character, and getting rid of the spear takes away some of the flavor. What I mean by story potential is not to say that it has a direct impact on the game's story, but the story the player has created. 
And by flavor, I mean, wouldn't it be nice to use a spear the way it was meant to be used? Wouldn't it be nice if in a setting that sort of mimics the Roman Empire, we actually could roleplay as a legionary, huh? Wouldn't that be nice, huh? Setting up some phalanxes for people? I mean, come on, man. Poking at somebody behind a shield is like a Roman thing and a Greek thing. So when you set your game in a Roman and Greek style world, like, what are you doing? I know I sound butthurt and everything, and, and it's because I am. I'm very butthurt about this, okay? You know, spears were like the last thing you needed to remove, man. Long blades and short blades have been combined into one category because fuck you, that's why. Any questions? Dagger hand grips, thrusting techniques versus slashing with long blades. The techniques, the holds, the strategies of each weapon, it's so different that to lump them together is an injustice to daggers and knives. Axes and maces are now combined into blunt, which is fucking retarded. I mean, I know that when I go to look for an axe, I wonder to myself, gee, I wonder how blunt that axe head is, because I was thinking about beating someone to death with the flat end of this fucking thing later. Each of these decisions were likely made in service to simplifying the system to explain it to a wider audience that has only played on console, but also to the amount of skills you can pick divide evenly into the amount of skills that are available. 21 in case you're wondering. There's nothing wrong with the idea of that, so long as the cuts are elegant, and as I showed before, they aren't. Spells have been hit the hardest in the midst of all this cutting. There are 18 mysticism spell effects in Morrowind versus the 7 found in Oblivion. Illusion had 18 effects versus the 13 found in Oblivion. Conjuration, Restoration, and Destruction get by relatively unscathed. The real losers here are illusion and mysticism. Mysticism used to be where you got access to cool mechanical spells like Mark and Recall, Absorb Skill, Absorb health, detect animal, detect enchantment, as well as detect key. Reflect, dispel, and telekinesis survive the transition to oblivion, but mysticism was gutted worst. Some of the illusion cuts make more sense. The blind spell was likely cut because there's no longer a chance to hit someone with a weapon, so there's no value to scale up and down that makes sense. But it also doesn't make sense because unlike Morrowind, this game is not obsessed with numbers, but it's obsessed with how the game feels to play, the game feel, if you will. So it would have made sense if the player was blind and couldn't see what was in front of them. If we're using the character in-game as a surrogate for what our player can see, then it makes sense if the character's blind that so is the player. I mean, it's sort of the curse of being a first-person game. When you choose that perspective, you're choosing immersion. So every little thing that you do has to be simulated and shown to the player as if it were happening to them. That's the real loss here, is that every time a skill is cut, so is the possibility for clever gameplay scenarios and systems interacting in ways that they weren't meant to, creating chaos like real life, but so much more than real life. Seriously, Bethesda, if you keep cutting like this, I'm gonna have to put you on suicide watch. Magic has undergone another, more serious change, and that is the removal of levitation. With the banning of levitation magic, no doubt a racially motivated scheme orchestrated by the Dunmer-hating Todd Howard. The Telvanni will never forget this act of wretchedness, Todd. They will pass on the word of this transgression through generations, disguised as stories of your Fuda obsession. The truth will be revealed. While you may not be able to fly anymore thanks to the... The liberal government! You can float. See? Floating up this hill. Nothing wrong or weird looking about that. Just a half cat, half man thing floating uphill. Sneaking can be a time consuming skill to level if you do it the way you're supposed to, but we don't do things the way we're supposed to. What you do is you scope out a room with enemies and you find a nice little wall on the other side of them. Yes, this'll do just fine. Now we point at the wall, hit the auto walk key, and we walk away for a couple hours to clean the toilet. Two hours later, you have a ninja who can't be seen, even if you're grabbing somebody's tukas. All the same kinds of exploits from Morrowind work here, like spell creation and spell training, spamming the jump key, all of your classic favorites. But do you remember alchemy? My favorite thing was alchemy, back when it was still... good. I remember starting out as a nobody, slang and healing potions outside the temple, undercutting the competition inside, and then getting access to the good shit and making brain steroids. I'd stay up all night injecting it into my ass cheeks, and just as the high kicked in I'd make some more. All the while I was building an alchemy empire. It was a good loop. And now, alchemy's a shadow of itself. Firstly, it's no longer possible, as far as I can tell, to buy everything you need from a shop. I mean, you can find some components you need in an alchemy shop, but I've found their collection to be rather shit. 
If you want to level alchemy, you are best going to a tavern and buying up all the food. Stealing everything you can from barrels and going to local farms and picking as much food as you can. And mix it all together in your alchemy equipment to create the nastiest shit that's ever been mashed together in a mortar and pestle. Each potion is worth absolute shit. But the Restore Fatigue potions are the easiest to make and they also have the cheapest ingredients which are also just so happen to be the most plentiful. So it's good for leveling and making a little tiny bit of profit in early game. Well listen, the best way to level that skill to max is to take your lime and your coconut and as many scrolls as you can carry. Take that bundle of scrolls into your hand and hover your mouse over your watermelon and click. Your fingertips will spout watermelon shooting out one at a time, pristine copies of your melons for every scroll that you carry. It's a magic trick I like to call Exploiting Bethesda's Lack of Quality Verification. Soon we will have the answer to world hunger, and we will exploit it. I'm so hungry. Cat Jesus to the rescue, giving the poor their daily bread and daedric hearts. But first, we must make potions more potions, and more and more until we have a respectable collection of Restore Fatigue. Then we go to the local store and sell them all of our stock. Preferably this chick's store. She's an asshole. Take that capitalism! Have all my terrible junk! And I will take all of that juicy money! But if you were thinking of stacking potion effects, think again. That time, the time of breaking the game in fun and interesting ways has long ago passed. Bethesda found an elegant way to stomp on your fun by making it so only one effect of each type can be activated at once for potions and spells, so you won't be stacking brain steroids and making stupidly powerful potions, at least as far as I've been able to tell. But now, it's time for my favorite skill, the manly arts, boxing. Hand to hand has taken the biggest change, and for the better to be honest. Your attacks do health damage as well as damage to fatigue, and it makes it harder to knock people out before you kill them, but for enemies with large health pools, you'll be staggering and dropping their asses to their knees more often than a hooker during Mardi Gras. Because fatigue no longer affects hit rate and spell success, the point of hand-to-hand -hand was dwindling. So they made it damage health, which is absolutely fucking fine. This is my character, his name is Wong Feihung. He hails from elsewhere and has an affinity for kus 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 kuma, as well as knocking all the shit off your tables. And just like a cat, Fei Hung likes to start fights with others, and just as he's losing, calms his opponent. Then, once they drop their guard, ambushes them again. Wong Fei Hung learned the ways of con men and street crooks, and specializes in all things illusion. And boy, let me tell you, he makes the best out of it. There's something infinitely satisfying about using two skills together that aren't supposed to be used together and that you wouldn't think to use together, but work in hilarious ways. Like calming an opponent after you've punched them, and then calming them again before they can attack you. It's fantastic. Yeah, it feels like an exploit, but it's the best kind of exploit though. The one that makes you really smart for figuring it out, remember? I've said that before, right? I'm pretty sure I did. Lords and ladies, citizens of the Empire, I give you the Battle of the Ages! Combatants, steal yourselves! Lower the gates! Oblivion has some pretty sexy combat. Let's address the elephant in the room first. There's no chance to hit anymore. So if your weapon lands on a model, that enemy model gets hit. This means that the combat has shifted a little bit away from its combat simulation roots and has gotten closer in design to a first person action game, which is exactly what it is, so, you know. Now I love Morrowind, but this is one change that I'm more than happy to have. Morrowind's combat was a bit shit. It had its moments of fun, especially the magic system, but, well, let's just say that there's a reason I didn't mention combat in the video. If you're melee in Morrowind, your combat is a button measure. If you're melee in Oblivion, well, it depends. Are you a hand-to-hand -hand kind of guy, or are you a fuckboy? Look, now before we go any further, we need to talk about the uh, blandish dishwater way that Bethesda handled the weapon mastery system. First off, no matter the weapon, each perk at each level is the same for every other weapon, which is fucking retarded. See, when I came back to this game, I had forgotten all about that. 
but after leveling up my hand-to-hand -hand fighter and finding out, I get a disarm? I got interested and went back to find out what the other weapon classes get, only to find out that they get the same shit. Like then, okay, so what's the point of hand-to-hand -hand then? You know? <laughs> Bragging rights? It's dumb. I mean, disarming people with hand-to-hand -hand makes sense. You can grab wrists, you can do joint manipulation a lot easier than when you can when you're holding a weapon. Also, how do you paralyze someone with a weapon? I mean, you can stab a motherfucker in his spine and shit, and he'll fall to the ground, he'll be paralyzed, but I... I that dude ain't getting up in six seconds, I can tell you that much. That dude's staying on the ground, probably screaming, writhing in pain. If we're following the kung fu mythos in elsewhere, paralyzed makes sense because, you know, pressure points and all that shit, you know? Have you ever seen an old kung fu movie that used to do it to each other all the time? It's lame because this was an opportunity to think about the strengths of each weapon class. A forward power attack should increase the range of a thrusting attack for blades, and side power attacks with blunt weapons can stagger a blocking enemy, and so on. Like, what are these weapons functions? What are they good at? It's just a missed opportunity that I want to point out specifically. Anyway, there's a few classes of enemy AI. There's the NPC AI, which allows for fast movement, strafing, hit and run tactics, blocking, power attacking, as well is shifting to magic at range. This AI is the most dangerous because it's the least predictable at first, but this type of AI gets cheese fairly easy by baiting them in for attacks and stepping just outside of range while readying a power attack counter. The second type of AI is monster AI. This follows a pattern as well, but depending on the type of monster and their attacks, can either be way too predictable or a fucking nuisance. My least favorite enemy type's the scamp. Not because he's a difficult enemy, but because he's a goddamn fireball. It throws off my timing when I'm close up. And this isn't a criticism of the game so much as it is a criticism of me, but, you know. With monster AI, typically all you need to do is dart in and out of range, triggering the AI's short attack cycle, and after the hit detection goes off, run in and get a few free hits in. But if that subtype has a fireball or any type of range attack, it doesn't matter how well-timed your block counter is, you're getting hit. Melee fighters are the most interesting to me because they seem to be the best at pushing a melee fighter away. They're basically walking blenders. Like, they just keep coming at you swinging and swinging and swinging. If you try to stand in range with them, you're gonna get fucked up pretty bad. While Mage AI will try to run from melee while splashing you with spells. The thing that Oblivion did well was in creating these significant changes to how creatures behave. I like it when one of them little lizard dudes, you know, jumps at you, strikes you twice, and then slows down for just a minute while strafing side to side, waiting for his next opportunity. Meanwhile, you're taking your eyes off of your flank just long enough to get ambushed by a Dramora. In those scenarios, they happen often while closing the Oblivion Gates. You should not be here, mortal! The quickness by which the NPC AI move and strafe, getting to your back in mere seconds, and the way that they somehow know what you're gonna do, and manage to get out of the way of a power attack, forcing a whiff, and then they counterattack for massive damage, at higher difficulty levels the game punishes nearly every single mistake, but the combat becomes very stale at later levels, and there's a good reason for this, because you never quite make it above the power curve. You don't get to revel in that moment of godhood like you do in Morrowind. You can adjust the difficulty, but that feels too artificial then nothing is a challenge at a certain level. The gradient to godhood must be slightly increased, until even scenarios that were deadly to you previously are no longer challenging. That epiphany should take a while to get there, but it should eventually come. It's usually nice if the epiphany comes somewhere around Act 2, because in Act 3, you're gonna have to create a challenge that is so challenging that even the all-powerful player can't overcome easily. And that in and of itself is a very challenging design. For the designer. Oblivion is constantly leveling with you, so the challenge stays fairly flat, except in the occasions when the game throws a particularly difficult combination of creatures at you. The other thing, and this is a complaint about the scaling encounters, is that the monster types don't significantly change their behavior per race. The Scamp and the Clan Fear have nearly identical behavior, except the Clan Fear can't throw a fireball. I'd think the Clan Fear would have different hunting tactics than the Scamp. I mean, let's take Dungeons and Dragons for an example so that you can understand what the fuck I'm about to talk about. Kobolds are nasty little shitheads who scavenge and steal to survive. They also like to ambush and waylay travelers. The way they do this is through traps and tunnels. 
If you stumbled onto a kobold tribe's home, be prepared to get shot by bolts and arrows through tiny little tunnels that are too small to swing a sword in and too dark for a human to see. The kobolds will rarely fight you face to face and prefer to shoot their enemies from cover or attack them while they're vulnerable from a trap. Kobolds are throwaway enemies. You can use them as fodder against a player. The player can kill them with one hit at level one. They're pushovers, but it's not about their stats. It's about what they do with those stats that makes them dangerous. They use hit and run tactics and can be a real pain in the ass for those that don't have a fireball spell to flush them out of their tunnels. For another more direct example, take an imp from Doom 2016. Their fireballs come in two flavors, dangerous and more dangerous. They flank the player and hang from objects, hucking fireballs and jumping from platform to platform. Now, if you add a hell knight to this equation, that changes the fight dramatically. The combat is more like a puzzle you have to figure out, whereas the combat in Oblivion can tend to feel like a battle of attrition. You know, who will run out of healing items first, or how long am I willing to kite these enemies around until they die? As you can see, I am very conflicted about this combat, because on one hand it sounds like I really like it, which I do, but on the other hand it frustrates the shit out of me. What about challenge? Well, unlike Morrowind, where sometime around the 20th level you start to outpace the content, if you know what you're doing. Oblivion keeps a constant pace with you and respect the challenge. It never gets too difficult or too easy. It levels with you. Many people have spoken about this problem and I'm sure I don't have much to add, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. See, Morrowind's design was an accidental act of brilliance. You know, I'm not sure if they knew what they were doing or if they stumbled onto it, but the gameplay loop of explore, fight, loot was compelling as hell. But the combat wasn't exactly the most engaging, but at some point, you outleveled everything and can basically one-shot just about everything you came across. With Oblivion, you won't be doing that. In fact, the default difficulty level is dog shit as it makes everything you fight have a ridiculous amount of hit points, and the combat becomes a bit of a drag. At least in Morrowind, you knew there'd be an end to the pain once you cross the apex into godhood, but this fucking game just keeps leveling the goddamn monsters so your character never feels like Mr. Tough Guy Badass Man. He stays a pussy who is forever a hit away from dying. You may be against the whole power fantasy trope, but there's a reason games that feature a lone protagonist shooting his way through hordes of demons do so fucking well sales wise because it feels really fucking cool somewhat related to combat is armor morrowind kept the armor system from daggerfall and that it allowed you to mix and match so long as it made sense you could wear a plate mail right pauldron with a light armor left pauldron with different bracers and so on but it also let you wear clothing underneath your armor as well as robes over top of your armor this led to people enchanting every piece of clothing and armor they could wear and resulted in some pretty overpowered builds. The more you grinded out levels, ingredients, and specific pieces of gear. Oblivion seemed to take this responsibility unto itself and decided that anything that made the game easier, even in the late game, needed to be eliminated, including shit that actually made sense. How did Oblivion handle the layering of clothing problem with enchanting? Not by balancing it in a sensible way, by tweaking the max numbers a players could achieve, or Maybe not allowing you to layer enchanted items? Huh, that would have been a fix. No, it would seem that they decided on the most window lickery way to make it so that you can no longer wear clothing below or above your armor. Now, I can see this both ways, okay? It keeps the ways to exploit the system down, but it also makes it so clothing can truly be its own class of armor. The problem is, Disbelief! I'm supposed to believe that my character, okay, who is a cat, mind you, covered in hair from head to toe, is gonna put on a set of fucking chainmail without clothes underneath of it. What about his thorny cat dick? I would imagine wearing plate mail might not be the most concealing thing to wear without at least underwear. And what if his cat dick got stuck between the plates? Did you ever think about that, Todd? Did you? I know that you, and you alone, are responsible for the creation of Bethesda Games, and that not only are you the sole owner and proprietor of that establishment, as well as the character modeler, horse animation lead- Oh, oh, you didn't know he did horse animation? Yeah, dude, he was the fucking lead, as well as a man-sized quiz boy. But did you bother to stop and think about the many cat, lizard, and man dicks you were leaving to be crushed between the plates of armor when you made the decision to ban clothes? Did you, bastard? In honor 
honorable mention to the number of armor pieces in the game as well. Morrowind had eight different slots for armor, 11 if you counted clothing, and Oblivion has five in total meaning they cut six slots for armor and clothing based enchantments. The armor system has been gutted from one title to the next. It's fairly shit and my least favorite thing about Oblivion. Lastly, let's talk about magic, which got fucked right in the pooper. The wonderful thing about Morrowind was how the only limit to your magical potential was how many magicka points you had to spend. Of course, you might have a 0% chance to cast that spell successfully, but hey, that's life! Chances were, you'd be maxing your destruction skill somewhere around level 20, and you'd be capable of casting some incredibly powerful spells. In Oblivion, everything is obsessively balanced to the point where it's not really fun. All the spell effects you want to use are relegated to higher levels like summoning monsters requiring a level 25 and conjuring. I mean, I want to, I'm just going to rant here for a minute and I want you to understand why I'm a little bit pissed off about this. You see, you have a game that's all about open-endedness. Open-endedness and exploring and character building and everything else. And then you say that I'm going to put a level cap on when you're allowed to use certain things, like spells, and instead of making it progress naturally as you get better at that spell school, like it does in Morrowind, you chose the path of least resistance. The system you had before, where a spell fizzled if you failed it, was a good system. For magic, at least. It wasn't a great system for melee combat, but for magic, yes, there should be a chance to fail. And that chance to fail should go up as you wear heavy armor. Even light armor should give you a chance to fail your spell. Do you understand? And then your spell level, it can then be related directly to the chance to actually cast a spell correctly. Even without the armor penalties, Morrowind still had a great spell system. And you should have just kept it, if I'm being completely honest. Because magic should be overpowered. It should be incredibly, stupidly overpowered. But it should also be balanced in that it's difficult to do. Or you are a wet paper fucking napkin and one hit will kill you. There's so many ways to balance that shit out. But locking it behind a fucking level is so fucking lazy. It's such a slapdash lazy way to control the player and keep them from doing things that are fun. And it's fucking dumb. And I hope you guys stop that shit. The towns are large, with streets presumably wide enough to fit a wagon through, but they're also pristine, as if dirt and little bits of trash never blew in from time to time. Save for the occasional homeless person sleeping on a bedroll in someone's backyard, you're hard pressed to even find people on the streets. No drunks stumbling home from the bar, no street side market stalls, no people hanging clothes to dry on the line, no heralds ringing bells telling the latest news, no kids playing and screaming at one another while they play tag in the street. In other words, there's no life here. You'd think there'd be more people. It's been mentioned before, of course, by many people, but I, I bring it up because for a very specific reason, it destroys just about any sense of disbelief you might have had for everything that's going on around you. Because the logic is so illogical. So you've got a country that's basically infested with enemies from within, to the point where emperor's children are getting slain and emperors are getting killed as well under the protection of their elite guard. And being that they're under attack, and that they're under siege by the denizens of oblivion, right? You'd think that the whole entire country would get taken over because of just by the sheer lack of how many people they have. Like, have you ever stopped to count how many guards there are in a single town to protect it? Because I have. The answer is not enough to fight off an invasion. I mean, I guess this same criticism could be levied at Morrowind, but also you have to think about it like this. Morrowind was an island. It was also under protection by garrisons worth of Imperials. And sure, it made it feel like more could be on its way anytime. But the story constantly made you feel like the Empire had given up on Morrowind, and that helped to explain why there weren't more. In Oblivion, there's no such explanation. You can walk into any part of town and only find maybe 25 NPCs in that entire place, 47 total if you're counting guards. And even that number is a total spread out over several districts. And if we contrast that with how many people live in like a place like Baldur's Gate, 
you start to see how these towns are too small to be believable. Outside of towns, it's very rare to run into any other kind of settlement, be it a single house, an inn, or just a residence. There's nobody that you run into that isn't abandoned on your way from one place to another. How am I supposed to believe that you can defend your own borders? All of these people, regardless of age and sex, all live the bachelor life. None of these people have kids or grandchildren or great-grandchildren or elderly mothers that live with them because they can't live on their own anymore. No significant others or spouses. No nephew that just can't seem to get their lives together living in the basement. What a boring, stagnant, sterile, barren world these people live in. I mean, it's devoid of life or even the promise of life as these asexual aliens mill about in their artificial lives. Most NPCs do have schedules. Everyone calls me Stan the Ugly. Most people that don't own a shop in town will head over to the tavern or inn and stand around, occasionally shifting their attention from one wall to another wall five feet away. If you turn down the music, what do you hear in this game? Well met. I'm here to help if you need me. Greetings, Conjurer. Nothing. Just a complete lack of society. And that might be fine when you're out in the woods all by yourself, but not when you're standing in the middle of a town. It's eerie. It's like Orlando post-corona eerie. These towns feel so empty, so lifeless, so dull. A lot of it has to do with the environmental design. I have a feeling, though I can't confirm this, that this is due in part to the lack of power of the 360 and the PS3 at the time. Because there's hardly any clutter in these towns. No trash, no debris, no homes smashed together or tacked on top of one another, only separated by thin alleyways. No muggers waiting in the dark to steal your coin purse. There is less than nothing to do in these towns. You get missions in towns. You restock your supplies in town and sell your junk to a vendor to engage in the loop again. The loop I'm referring to is the loop I've spoken on at length in my other videos about addiction. The dopamine loop of explore, kill, loot, repeat. It's a fun loop, to be sure, but it's a shallow loop. It's a loop that focuses on not engaging the brain, but sort of lulling it into a trance. That trance being the combat trance that you'll feel in a lot of really good, well put together action games. Sort of like Doom Eternals. You, know, you may die a whole lot, and I died constantly in that game. The way that the loop was structured, it kept me engaged throughout and literally lulled me into a trance like state where sometimes I'd even forget to do the things I was supposed to do in order to stay alive. And that's Oblivion, basically, in a nutshell. It's a game that really tries to hyper-focus on what it finds fun about itself. Martin, I remember when we met. I had just closed the portal to Oblivion and broken the siege around your church. You were afraid when I found you, alone. You thought your god had abandoned you. But you didn't expect me. Wong Fei Hung, the kung fu fighting alcoholic catman, to come to your rescue. The way you looked at me, I knew I needed to take you far away from Kavach. You said you wanted me to take you to the Priory, but I knew better. I knew what you needed. You needed a little... adventure. Things started slow for us at first, doing favors and delivering goods. But when we got to the Imperial City, that's when we got an idea of a lifetime. We should join the arena. Of course, you chickened out last minute and waited for me by the ramp as I had my first fight. I was so angry at you for not joining me, and every time I came down that ramp, I stared you down. But that's the thing, you see, you were always there for me every time, waiting for me to come down. And though your god made a pussy out of you, I knew you worried about me. We traveled the world, visiting every town you'd never been to, and, and walked through the streets of empty towns and wondered where all the kids were. It was easy to get bored in the taverns and inns where nary a drunk dwelled and nary a whore lived. We left the city for the forests and dungeons, figuring we would find more life there, and we did. We dropped by the Priory at some point in our journey and picked up your friend Joffrey. He was single-minded, always going on about some fort in the mountains. But our group was growing, and so were our memories together. BFFs, best friends forever. 
But then, one day, we came across a wanted poster of a man named Gray Fox. You remembered a couple of people from the soup line who may know where this Gray Fox fella might be, so we put out enough feelers and eventually our tentacles touched the guild. We joined, reluctantly of course, and were put to work, breaking into people's houses and fencing off the goods until we caught the eye of the man himself. Do you remember stealing an Elder Scroll? There's no one else who could say they've done the same. What I remember about Oblivion the most is the guild quests that slowly unraveled to end so bombastically that they stick in your memory every time you become the head of a new guild. I remember the silly bugs that cause you to have immortal bodyguards following you around everywhere. Oblivion is just a collage of memories that you create through the faction narratives, assisted by them somewhat, but not freed by them like Morrowind. And while Oblivion seems determined to shackle you to a somewhat plausible reality with its rebalancing of systems and exploits smoothing at every turn, it is still possible to bow those systems and make them give in due to relentless prodding. Oblivion puts all the goods up front, no foreplay just grudge fucking, and while it is difficult and time consuming to break, it's really fun to watch it bend. I think this was the game out of all the games in a series that I was looking forward to playing the most because it's the one I haven't played in the longest time. It was nice to go back and visit the world again and notice things I didn't notice the first time around and to appreciate it for what it managed to do with its limited resources. Consoles at the time were so underpowered that it most likely led to concessions, but it's still amazing that they were able to do it at all. I think that's the main reason Bethesda has been forgiven for so much in the past because the past is when they gave us so much joy. Let's hope good things lay ahead for us and Bethesda Bethesda in the future. Or not, talking shit about Bethesda's great ad revenue. Either way, it's a win for me and other talking head YouTubers alike. That I will have to feast on humans! Roar! This has been a rant from strategy and now that you heard it, make sure you like the video, even if you didn't. <laughs> and be sure to ring that bell so YouTube can annoy you outside of the app when you're having dinner or, or having a good wank in the upstairs bathroom. Also make sure to hit up my Twitter and also subscribe to the second channel where I'll be posting short stories and audiobooks when time frees up as well as get some more time for experimental fare if that's something that tickles your taint. Also, make sure you hit up my Patreon if you're looking to support the channel. I love you all. Stay safe out there and don't inhale any sneezes. <laughs>